Hey guys, how's it going? So today we're going to be going through the GPTQ, uh, also known as the Accurate Post Training Quantization for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So this method has been quietly used, especially on the open source uh, large language models, uh, such as LaLama, I think it was also produced by Meta. Um, so yeah, it has been quite popular and I thought uh, we shall cover it. So today I'll be going through the paper and as usual, we're going to go through the code so that we get to understand what they did. Um, so I feel like the efficient deep learning techniques like, you know, uh, your sparsity, quantizations, all of this stuff uh, are quite important, especially if like AI is going to become mainstream, like making these models to be as efficient as possible i think these techniques are going to be uh very very important so i thought it would be a good idea for us to kind of like cover these efficient deep learning techniques and uh i have some videos that i'm preparing then i'll produce them also uh so how will this go today is that we're gonna start with the paper because if i go straight in the code it will be like uh you're working through this code but you don't have a map right so uh th then if i start with the paper i think this way we can get a high level overview of and the main idea of the paper then when we come to the code we kind of like have a high level overview of what this is all about in, in a much more good way then we can actually try by all means to grow the the code um, so yeah, without wasting any time, let's get into the paper and I'll walk you through some of the, the ideas that they proposed then, yeah. So the author proposed a GPTQ method, which is a one-shot weight quantization method based on the approximate second order information. So they state that this method is highly accurate and highly efficient, in which it can quantize GPT models with 175 billion parameters in approximately four GPU hours, right? That's quite impressive. So they use this method called layer-wise quantization alongside with other techniques, which we're gonna get into. So just to give you a better perspective about this layer-wise quantization, we can think of it as a method of compressing the size of weights within the neural network by producing their precision. So this is done essentially by solving the reconstruction problem of each layer within a network where the goal is to find a quantized uh, matrix of weights that minimize the error with relative to the full precision layer. Hence here they state also that the objective is to find the matrix of quantized weight denoted by this uh, that blue hat, which minimize the squared error relative to the full precision layer output. So this can be reinstated with this equation here. So this equation essentially um, we can think of it as like the objective function used within this layer-wise quantization to find the quantized um, weight uh, that minimize the squared error between the full precision, yes, the full precision weight um, output and the quantized layer output, right? So we can think of this as like the weight that have been quantized and this is the full weight. Uh, full precision weight and this x here represent the input so the output between these two we want to minimize their difference so this way we get to know that this w hat this weight right um essentially is like we quantize correctly that's what i that's how i can explain it right so but um this R mean here uh, notation represent the argument of the minimum or the set of values that minimize the expression following this, right? So the, the double bar here, uh, the double bar within this equation, we can think of this as the expression that indicate the Euclidean norm. So this measures the distance between two vectors. So the squared Euclidean norm is used in the case uh, to simplify the optimization uh, problem. But yeah, that's what this, this, uh, this layer-wise quantization does. So now looking into the optimal brain quantization. So the methods start from the observation that uh, the equation, the sum of squared errors that we discussed over here can be written as the sum of squared errors over each row of weight. 
The OBQ handle each row independently, quantizing one weight at the time, while always updating all non not yet quantized weight in order to compensate for the error incurred while quantizing a single weight. So essentially what they're saying here is that if we have a matrix like so, um, then each row will be considered independently uh, like so. The weight that we're currently quantizing, right, we're going to have an error that we incur for quantizing this weight then these other unquantized values within the row will be updated so that um, we can actually be able to compensate for the error that has been uh, incurred by this, uh, by, this, um, by this quantized weight. So just to summarize, so this OBQ method, it works by considering each row uh, of weight right independently and then we quantize each weight uh, at the time while updating all the remaining uh, weights to compensate for the error in CAD by quantizing um, a single weight. The goal here is to find optimal weight to quantize next uh, then we'll see actually how the equation looks like. Um, so they state that the since the corresponding objective is quadratic uh, let me scroll down, whose Hessian is denoted by this formula here, where f denotes the set of remaining full precision weight, uh, the greedy optimal weight to quantize next, which is denoted by this wq. Just to give you a better perspective, this Hessian matrix, we can think of it as the square matrix of the second order partial directive of scalar valued function. So essentially, it pro is going to provide us with uh, information about the local curvature of the function at the particular point, right? So um, that's that. Then this, this WQ is going to be denoting the weight that we want to quantize next. And they state that the corresponding optimal update for all the weights in F denoted by this are given by the formula by the following formulas where quantized w rounds w to the nearest values on the quantization grid and i feel like this quite is quite interesting as we're going to see in the code actually how they achieve this uh, so essentially they, they you will see that they use things like such as scales uh, they use things such as zeros to actually push uh, the quantized value to be within this range of the quantization grid. So it's going to be quite interesting. I'll try by all means to link what they're saying here with the code um, as, 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 as much as I can. But here, just to kind of like explain this in much detail, uh, I'm just going to change my pen here. So this WQ is the weight that we want to quantize next, right? So then the R the R mean WQ uh, denotes the value of uh, weight quantized that we want to quantize. Uh, that minimizes the expression within this um, within this uh, parenthesis. Then this quantized WQ is the quantized value of WQ, right? Like yes. Then this bracket here, we can think of it as the squared error incurred by quantizing wq right then this here we can think of this as the inverse of the hessian matrix which is computed based on the uh based on the remaining unquantized values so uh essentially the the, the idea here is that this is going to provide us with the second order information about uh, about the behavior of the objective function, right? So it's going to be used to calculate the optimal values or the optimal updates for the remaining unquantized weights, right? Um, so that's what this uh, this is all about. Then this function here, just to iterate, they state that um, and the corresponding optimal update of all weights in F denoted by this. So this denotes the optimal update of the optimal update of all the weights so we, we can think of this as 
it give us the all the optimal update for each remaining unquantized weight so it's a vector is we can think of this as it's going to be a vector that is going to be containing all the optimal update for all unquantized weights so we said that every time we quantize each element when we have these these unquantized weights right that's what we said now um then for us to make the updates to these that's where this it's going to come into to update these so uh, i think that's what it means but if i confused you there just to summarize so that we can all both have a solid understanding the equation computes the quantized values of wq uh, that minimize the squared error uh, given the remaining unquantized weight so the uh, and then compute the optimal update for the remaining unquantized using this remaining unquantized weights based on the Haitian metrics. So that's what this does. So uh, they state here the bottleneck of this OBQ uh, method in that its runtime for a D row by D column matrix has a cubic independencies with this term complexity is D row D column cube means that applying it to models with billions of parameters is extremely expensive. Just to weigh in on this uh, term complexity, so the runtime of OBQ scales with the number of uh, parameters in the model because it has to go through um, each weight uh, within in the in the weight matrix and quantize it. So the process involves calculating the Hessian matrix. Uh, which has the size proportion to the number of weights in the layer being quantized, if I'm not mistaken. Because of we said that the Hessian matrix is a square matrix that measures the curvature of a loss function with respect to its weight. So as the size of the weights uh, increases, right, so the this matrix, the Hessian matrix, also grows in size. So which means that calculating it becomes extremely expensive, right? So, um, so to justify this, I think to justify this runtime here, I think the OBQ needs need to calculate the Hessian, uh, the Hessian for every weight in the weight matrix. Uh, the term complexity of the algorithm become cubic in the number of parameters, hence this is going to be the runtime. So I think uh, that's what I'm. Uh, I think. Uh, explain this but anyway all of these things that we explained they are not necessary like the contribution of the paper the contribution of the paper starts here so this is where the author uh, contributes uh, on top of the obq method so let's get to understand so the so they try to make it as efficient as possible because of as you can see the runtime here it just does not scale to billion of parameters uh, models like uh, GPT. So what are the things that they did to make sure that the method can scale to that? So the first observation that they realized was that the OBQ method um, quantize weights in a greedy order, right? So it always picks the weight which currently incurs the least additional quantization uh, error. So if we think about it, like because of this obq method works within the row and within that row there is weight right and it's going to quantize a weight and this weight here that is going to quantize it has to incur the least additional quantization error so in this makes sense intuitively because of you want to quantize the weights that do not actually impact your model output right so they are not significant so to speak uh, and I think if we can go back uh, just to link what we are currently reading with what we read, uh, we can see that here they state that uh, the greedy optimal weight to quantize next is denoted by this WQ. So this WQ is like, um, it tells us the, the weight that we're going to have to quantize next. And um, that's why this is the weight that is actually minimizing the, 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 the squared error. Right, given given the the the, the updates of these weights of these unquantized weights, so to speak. But anyway, 
the, the, the point that I'm, I'm trying to raise is that um, essentially based on the observation of that, they realize that actually they can try to improve this uh, by actually having some sort of like an order to quantize these weights. So let's, let me read it for you so that you can get it. So they state that the original OBQ method quantized rows of W independently in a specific order defined by the cons corresponding error. By construct, we will aim to quantize the weights of all the rows in the same order. So that's like the significant thing that they they were doing here and we'll show that this typically yields results with final squared error that is uh, similar to the original solution as a consequence is the set of unquantized weights uh, denoted by this f and similarly this um, hessian matrix is always the same for all the rows in more detail the latter is due to the fact that um, hf depend on the layer input of xf which are the same for all the rows and not on any weight therefore we have to perform the update given by the equation only d column times once uh per column so this reduced the overall term term complexity from this uh cube column cube to this uh term complexity based on the observation that they did so by just following the order instead of like um quantizing by the by the by the weight that uh by the weight that that incurred the least amount of error um but they say that this method that they came up with of like uh the order in which they're gonna take to quantize the weight will not work so what they what they propose to work is that they they aim to make it work with this lazy batch update. So this is their second observation again. So they state that first, a direct implementation of the scheme described previously will not be fast in practice because the algorithm has a relatively low compute to memory access, right? For example, equation three, need to update all MN elements of a potentially huge matrix using just flops for each row. Such a provision cannot properly optimize massive compute capabilities for modern GPUs. So essentially, you can think of it this way. So the practical implementation issue with the certain algorithm has a low compute to memory access. In other words, the algorithm requires a lot of memory access to perform its computation, which can be which can become a bottleneck. Uh, so especially on the modern GPU that have a computational computational power but relatively low memory bandwidth so what the author do then to overcome this problem is to use this method called um lazy lazy batching so lazy batching essentially takes the advantage of the fact that the rounding decision of each column only depend on the update performed on that column so right so um hence the update can be grouped uh in, in, uh, can be grouped and processed in a batch of subset of column instead of processing each column separately because of each column is independent. So this approach reduces the amount of memory access required and allow for faster GPU utilization. So uh, that's like this, the, the, the main thing that they, 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 they try to, to achieve here. So um, let me show you that passage. So yeah, I think there is it here. So they state that this make it possible to lazy batch update to get a thus achieving much GPU utilization. Concretely, we apply the algorithm to B equals to 128 columns. So they, they process 28, uh, 28 columns. Uh, they make, yeah, 28 columns at, at the time. So that that's the observation that, uh, that they did. Then... I feel like all of these observations that they, they, they do is like they're, they're, they are dependent on one another. Also, this here, for the previous one to work, it requires this uh, Cholsky reformulation because if not, then these values of these updates within this um, matrix here, uh, right, becomes indefinite. So 
so what, what, what they needed to do in this case, uh, they, they state that to address this, we begin by noting that the only information required from this matrix where FQ denotes the set of unquantized weights when quantizing uh, W. So more precisely, the element uh, in this row, starting from the diagonal, the consequences is that we could pre-compute all of these rows using a more numerical stable method without using any significant increase in memory consumption. Indeed, the row removal via for our symmetric essentially correspond to taking Cholesky decomposition. So, uh, so, so, but just to summarize, they, they use this uh, Cholesky kernel to compute all the information uh, up front. So this way they get to solve this, this, this problem of this uh, Hessian matrix becoming indefinite. So essentially when it becomes indefinite, then the updates to the weights, to the remaining weights of or the, or the unquantized weights is gonna become um, incorrect. So they, they needed to, 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 to use this technique, yeah, the, the Cholsky technique. So uh, the Cholsky reformulation, I mean to say. So yeah, I think that's what they did. Um, some of these techniques, are, I think I'll, I'll try by all means to explain them in the code in a much more intuitive way. Um, but yeah, I think that's like the main, the main, the main things that they, they did. So essentially, uh, they they adding up into this optimal brain quantization and what they did to, to scale to like billions of parameters just to summarize is that the order that's what that's the most important thing that they also did was to observe the order and then they tried to come up with more like um, uh, a, a, a defined order that they go into to to uh, to perform the the updates rather than uh, choosing the weight that is going to incur the least error then then because of uh, they of subsequently because of they realized that okay these columns are independent on how you update how you perform the update so what you can do is that you can just batch them and process them that way then this way you get like the memory efficiency of this technique but then they realize that actually when you lazy when you lazy batch then you have a problem within the matrix hashing matrix which the values can become indefinite, then this can cause the incorrect updates within the unquantized weights or the remaining weights. So they use this Cholsky reformulation to calculate um, the weights up front, right? To, to compute all the information up front. So this way, I think that's what they did. But anyway, um, those are the key things that they, they try to add into this. So anyway, let's go into the code and uh, try to understand it from there. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll try by all means to make sure that I make it much easier for you guys to understand. So um, how are we going to go about this, guys, that we're going to start with this quantize.py file. Um, this is because the meat or the main algorithm behind the paper is, is within this file called uh, the gptq.py file. Uh, and we can see that it imports the quantization file. So there's a dependency between the two. Uh, the reason I'm starting with the quantize file is because within this GPTQ file, we can see that they're using these functions uh, that they call like find params, you know, uh, quantize.ready. So I want, when we come to this file, you have a better idea of what these functions are. So this way you get to understand in a much better way. So uh, then we have, uh, we're going to also cover the model utilities. These are the only three files that I'm going to cover. I'm not skipping any files, by the way. This is mainly because these three files that I'm covering, they are the main files that are required to quantize a model. So like you're pretty much going to get the idea that we spoke about in the paper. Um, uh, then I'm going to divide this into two. So the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to, in the in this video, we're going to cover like these files, the core idea behind the paper. Then in the next video, I'm going to have a practical implementation whereby we're going to quantize the model, the Lama model, if I get access to the weight uh, model. Um, if not, I can use any model on, on, on Hugging Face, then we can actually quantize that. So this way we get to have a practical implementation of this algorithm. So that will be actually cool. 
Um, but yeah, that's how we're gonna go about things. Without wasting any time, let's get into this quantize.file file. So uh, starting with this function called quantize, essentially, before I, I tell you what these things mean, I'd like to kind of like highlight the high goal of this function. So we can think of this function as trying to map the values within this x, which is the input, uh, to a finite set of possible values. So to think about it. So so the, the values within this x, you can think of it as like they're going to be represented by a uh, code, right? So this essentially is going to help us to reduce the memory usage or the computation time because of we're moving away from high precision value to some sort of like uh, low precision value, right? So how it works is that we have this, uh, we have this scale and we have this zero, we have this maximum quantization. So we can think of this maximum quantization if it's something that is positive, we want to, we want it to be our limit, right? We want it to be our limit. By limit, I mean, if we want to start at zero, right, which is our starting point, then we want to go all the way to the maximum quantization. So we want our values to lie between this range. That's why this maximum quantization mean. But if it's not, essentially it's um, it's negative, we want to apply this function. So what does this function do? So we can think of each, we want uh, for each element in X, we want to check if it's closer to the scale, right? Uh, or if it is closer to zero value. If it is closer to scale, uh, we want to set that element uh, to scale. If it is closer to zero, we want to set that element to zero. How so? We do this because as you can see, this is a condition. We ask ourselves, is x greater than scale divided by two? This is a Boolean value, it's gonna return zero or one because um, obviously like if it returns one, then you're gonna multiply it by scale, then we get the scale is if it's not then similarly here if like x is less than zero we're gonna multiply by zero so we get that zero element so because of it's a boolean value so one multiplied by that is gonna get that value so just to give you a better uh, better perspective let's assume that we have uh minus three and we have uh minus three as our zero value then we have three as our scale value so essentially we can think of like we're gonna set some of the values to be between here if between this range between this range here but if it, x is not greater or x is not less than this zero then we can think of here we're gonna have zero because this is gonna be a symmetric um it's gonna adopt the symmetric way because of this is the going to be our range right so I think we can think of this as a binary quantization uh, to keep for scale and zero values, right? Um, then if quantas, if this max quantization essentially is gonna be uh, positive, what are we gonna do in this case? Just to make example, we can think of we're gonna have zero like so, and the maximum quantization is gonna be three. So we can think of here, we have three. So we want our values to lie between here so the purpose of this scale essentially is to uh we want to map the values of x to the closest integers uh multiple of of specific values for instance let's say scale is 0 0.2 so we want to create some sort of like a multiple between this range so we're gonna have 0 0.2 and we're gonna have 0 0.4 so all the values have to occupy these range so this is like um a finite set of possible values that I was put I was talking about. So it's gonna be uh, zero point six. So it's gonna follow that uh, that logic. That's like so. Then we're gonna return uh, the scale uh, multiplied by q minus zero. Um, then we getting into this class called quantizer. So we have this function here called uh, configure which take uh, all of these parameters, bits per channel, per channel if we want to quantize per channel, if it's true, then we have this symmetric, um, also it's gonna be a Boolean. Then we have this mean squared error, which we're gonna get into. So we uh, this self.max quantization is set to torch.tensor two to the power of base minus one. 
Essentially, we can think of this as a mathematical formula for calculating the maximum uh, value that can be represented by a binary number within a certain number of bits. For instance, let's say we re we represent this uh, we remove we represent this bit by five. So two to the power of five minus one. This is going to give us uh, thirty one. So what this means essentially is that um, the maximum value that can that can be represented by five bit binary number is going to be thirty one. So thus thirty one is going to be our maximum uh, quantization value here. Okay, then we have this uh, per channel, which you're gonna see it here because that's when we want to quantize per channel. So we have to transform uh, the input uh, as we get them because we wanna quantize uh, per channel. Then we also have this self dot symmetry. We wanna see that uh, in a second. Uh, then we have this if the treats. So we can think of this as like the ternary quantization representing each weight or uh, activation as either minus one or zero or one instead of using the full range uh, of values. So that's what that will do. Then we have this find params function. So uh, essentially we can see that we're gonna take the shape of X, right? We go with this input here and we're gonna check if X dot solve the channel is true or false. If it is true, what we want to do is that we're going to check if the length of shape is 4 and we're going to change the dimension of this x. So for example, uh, just to put this into a better perspective, uh, so let's say that we have a four dimensional input with like uh, input. So like four dimensions with input of n by c by h by height by width. Right. Um, so where n, we can think of this n is going to represent the batch. Then this c is going to represent the channel number of channels. Then this is going to be height and width, the special dimensions. So if the channel is set to true, which it uh, in this case we can assume that it's set to true, the function essentially will flatten, will flatten. Uh, uh, x along the special dimension and operate on each uh, channel independently. So we were gonna have, I think, we're gonna have two dimensions here. So all of these stuff, I think they're gonna be having two dimensions. Uh, that's what we want. So I think it's gonna be batch by, we're gonna be having batch by, by all pixels. So like so. And similarly here, what we want to do is that we go into um, take the shape, the last shape, and we're going to set minus one to ask Python to figure out the first dimension. And we're going to transpose this. So but the point is that we can see that this function is going to set x to have two dimensions. That's what we want to work with. Else if solve the uh, per channel, is not true, then we're gonna flatten this and add um, uh, add a dimension here and squeeze zero. Then um, what do we have? We have these values here. So things are gonna get interesting now. We have these uh, temp values and x min, x max. So what we're doing here is that we're taking the maximum value within the first uh, dimension and we're taking the maximum value within the first uh, dimension. So x min and x max. And we have this torch dot zeros, which is going to be the shape of the first dimension also, like so. So these minimum values and maximum values are taken from the row. So we can think of like within each row, we're taking the minimum and maximum value. So we have this uh, self-symmetric. Just for better perspective, we can think of this symmetric as it ensures that the positive and the negative uh, quantization values are equally spaced within um, zero. Then we have this x max, which is going to become the absolute uh, of the negative value and it's going to become the maximum value between the absolute x min and x max. So if any value within this x min is negative zero, 
essentially we want to set that value to be uh, negative x max just for better perspective we can think of like here we have a tensor in which we have um let's say the maximum values in this case it's going to be zero point um you know i'm going to make an example here just bear with me then it's going to be 0 0.800 we have 0 0.800 then our x min uh, it's going to take the negative of those so it's going to be tensor that's negative 0 0.800 it's like so negative um point eight zero 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 if these values initially were zero so that means they were going to be set to this that's what this course does but anyway um if x min or x max is zero then we want to set these to negative one and plus one um then we have this if self max uh, quantization is less than zero uh meaning that is negative then uh the maximum value is used as a scale in this case and the minimum value is going to be used as the zero point um otherwise what we want to do is that we want to set the the scale is computed as the range of the <clears throat> tensor divided by the maximum quantization and the zero point is going to be calculated if like we have the self dot symmetric we're going to take self to scale then self dot mutation self dot max quantization plus one divided by two um yeah so uh, uh, then we have this self dot zero which is torch that round x min divided by self dot scale so essentially you can think of this as this is the case of symmetric quantization so the zero value is calculated as x min divided by x uh self dot scale which ensures that the minimum value of the input tensor are mapped to zero after scaling and shifting. So similarly here, we can think of this as like, this ensures that the positive and negative quantization level are equally spaced within zero. Um, so just to kind of like uh, re, 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 re say whatever I said, uh, or maybe make it much easier or intuitive. So the purpose of this uh, self dot zero is to shift the quantized values where it says that they are centered around zero which help with the quantization error so for symmetric uh, the zero point is said to be the main point the, the midpoint like we made example there so this is between the minimum and maximum value so this ensures that the values are evenly distributed around zero so whereas with the symmetric um the zero point is said to be the values that uh, that maps to the zero code which can be negative also right so i hope that make uh that makes sense some of these stuff might not make sense uh if you're not familiar with like quantization like zero points and stuff like that uh but yeah i'm trying by all means to uh, to kind of like uh, clarify at least give you the intuition of why they're doing this anyway if our MSE here is x equals to true, so what we want to do is that we want to calculate the error uh, with respect to the quantized value. So here we're going to quantize x and we're going to calculate the error of actually quantizing that, right? So we can think of the purpose of this code is to adjust the scaling uh, zero points for quantizing input data to reduce precision while we minimize the MSE between the input uh, data with the quantized version okay uh then we have this if not self per channel uh so essentially we can think of like if uh wait right if it's not true or uh, if it's true what we're gonna do is that we're going to repeat the scaling uh we're going to repeat the scale and zero tenths along the first dimension that's why you would take shape zero and we're going to repeat it here right if not, then we want to repeat it across the first if uh, if length not equals to three, we want to repeat it across the first dimension. Else is going to be the second dimension. Okay, that's what this does. That's why we're going to repeat the the scale in zero dimension. Um, and then this code here, essentially, we can think of it as like it ensures that the 
uh, what's this? The the scales, the, the scale in the zero points tends to have the correct shape to be applied to the input uh, to the input tensor during quantization. So uh, by reshaping the tensor based on the shape of the input, it ensures that um, the, that the quantization is performed correctly across the specific uh, input dimensions. So that's what this code does. Essentially, you can see that we check the dimensions of each shape here, and we try to set the correct scaling and zero point to be the correct shape. Uh, we have this function here, uh, quantize, which is going to call this function that we did cover right here. So yeah, I feel like we pretty much have an idea of these functions. So uh, I'll say let's now get into like the main function and see how these are getting used. So maybe we will get like a very, very good understanding this time around. We have this class uh, GPTQ in which we're going to take a layer as stated in the paper that we're going to quantize uh, layer by layer. So uh, then we clone these weights within the layer and we try by all means to, to flatten them. Uh, I think the goal here is to essentially uh, set these weights to be a, a two-dimensional matrix. So uh, for instance, if we have a convolutional 2D, we're going to flatten them uh, on the first dimension. Uh, similarly here, if like we have a convolutional 1D, we're going to just transpose the weight. So uh, we can think of, we want the shape of the weight to be D row by D column, whereby the D row is the number of rows and the D column is the number of columns. I think that's what we want to do. Um, then we have this uh, torch dot zeros in which we're going to set this, um, this uh, Hessian matrix to be this shape, right? So that's what uh, the Hessian matrix will be. So the, the, this matrix will be used to compute the Hessian uh, of the objective function with respect to the weights. So we're gonna use it, uh, we're gonna see how it's getting used. Then we have this self.n uh, sample. Um, so we can think of this n sample attribute is set to zero and will be used to keep track of the number of sample used uh, during the, the quantization process. So uh, this function called add batch, uh, essentially you can think of it as like it's going to be used to update the Hessian matrix with the, uh, with the information from a new batch of input and output pairs. So these input here and output are the tensor, are the tensors representing the input and output of the layers, okay? So what we do is that we check if the input is equals to uh, equals to two, and we're gonna add uh, we're gonna add a new dimension here. So it is assumed to be a single input, and it's, uh, it is unsqueezed to create a batch size of one. So we have we're gonna have this temp, which is going to hold the first uh, dimension of the input. Then what we do is that we're gonna check if our layer um, self dot layer is equals to n dot linear, or it is uh, transformer dot conv one d. Uh, then what we want to do in this case is that we want to reshape it. Um, if the length of the input shape equals to three, then we want to reshape it. So I think this is going to be a feature size by batch size, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then we're going to easily transpose the input uh, like so. Okay, um, and then we're gonna have this is instance, which is gonna take, we're gonna check if the self dot layer is equals to, and then go on, and then dot uh, conv 2D. So what we're trying to do with this unfold, um, essentially is used, we're trying to extract the patches from the input image tensor corresponding to, uh, to the kernel uh, in the convolutional layer. So the kernel size parameter uh, we can think of this as it specify the size of each kernel and the pairing, dilation. Uh, so this is to determine how the kernel is applied across the input uh, tensor. Okay, so uh, the, the, the output of this is going to be, I think, batch size by number of patches by, uh, let me see. So we're going to have 
page size by number of pages by uh, page size right so uh, because now we have to work with two dimensional metrics when you flatten this we're gonna have uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna have an instance whereby where each row corresponds to a patch and each column corresponds to to an element within a patch. So we can have a patch within a row and each column correspond to uh, to an element uh, within in the patch. Okay. Um. I hope that's that. Then we have this uh, self dot Haitian matrix multiply by equals to self dot n sample divide by n sample plus temp. So the method here update the uh, the Haitian matrix by multiplying it with the ratio of the all numbers of samples. Right. Uh, this is to give uh, more weight to the existing Haitian matrix while incorporating new information. So we also, what we do is that we also, uh, the end sample attribute is also updated with new information here. That's why we have this temp. And don't forget that the temp is just this, the first uh, value from the input shape, okay? Then here we just uh, normalize this and we just add the input um, multiplied by the input transpose to the self.hessian um, value here. But like I said that, the essentially the goal here, essentially the purpose of this is to update the Hessian matrix with the new information from a new batch of the input and output pairs. That's what this function does. So uh, anyway, now going into this faster quant function. So um, this uh, function faster quantization essentially is going to be the function that is going to quantize the weights. So um, I don't know if you can still remember, but in the paper, they spoke about the lazy batch updates. So they mentioned that essentially uh, the algorithm has to apply. Uh, we have to apply the algorithm to 128 columns at the time while keeping the updates contained to those columns. So in this case, we can see that the block size is 128, as mentioned in the paper. So it's 128 columns. So the first thing that we do in this case is to clone the weights. And I think here we're trying to maintain the two dimensional uh, matrix of the weights so that we can be able to apply the updates correctly uh, within the correct um, uh, within the correct dimensions. We have this self quantizer that ready. Uh, essentially, we can think of here, we're trying to check if the quantizer has found any parameter required for quantization. If not, uh, essentially what we're gonna do is that we're gonna call this uh, find params, which is a function that we covered. Um, so this is uh, this is actually gonna be called to find the required parameters. Then we have this uh, Hessian matrix, which is gonna be set to uh, it's gonna be self to it's gonna be set to self dot h, which is uh, Hessian matrix. So essentially, during the quantization process, the Hessian matrix is going to be used to determine um, how much to adjust each weight uh, in order to minimize the quantization error. Okay, uh, we have this torch the diagonal Hessian matrix, which is going to be equal to zero. Uh, so here, what's happening is that uh, I think I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think we're trying to set this. Uh, these these uh, they call them dead to to one because we're avoiding to divide by zero. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think that's what is happening. So uh, we, we replace any zeros with one. Uh, so this means that that the weights within the Hessian matrix will not be updated during the quantization process. Then we have these weights also. We set them to to zero. Uh, the ones that were dead. I think it's doing the same thing there. So um, we're keeping track of the losses. Um, so we're gonna calculate the loss of quantizing weights, uh, including we're gonna keep track of the quantized weights. So that's why we're creating this, um, this shape of weight like, uh, so that we can be able to keep track of each weight. And then we have this temp, 
So uh, essentially, we can think of this as uh, it's calculated as a percentage of the mean of the diagonal of the um, self dot Hessian matrix. So the diagonal indices of the self uh, Hessian are going to be incremented by this temp, like so. Then we have um, these uh, Cholosky inverse. So I don't know if you can still remember, but in the paper, we covered the Cholosky reformulation in which we stated that uh, the, the Cholosky kernel is going to be used to compute all the information we're going to need for the Hessian matrix up front. So uh, that's what it's going to do. But in this case, uh, the Hessian matrix is going to be factored uh, using the Cholosky decomposition and the Hessian of the upper triangular matrix is going to be stored within this uh, Hessian uh, inverse. Then what we do uh, is stated in the paper that we're processing each block size or I think they called it a batch. So you can tell that we're going to move 128, uh, I mean 128 columns. So we're going to extract 128 columns at the time. So that's what we're going to process. So uh, you can think of the loop iterate over the columns of the weight matrix for each given layer. Uh, each iteration process a block of block size column at the time. So that's what this will do. Um, then I'm just going to go straight to this for loop. Uh, these are just initializations of losses, uh, Hessian inverse and weights. So that's fine. Uh, for each column in a block, um, we're going to compute the inverse of the submatrix that correspond uh, to the current column, right? Um, then we have this function called quantize, so which is going to quantize the weight. So this is small w because of it's within this hash, then we extract this column, right? So it's important to 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 see this. Um, so yeah, it's important because of I'm linking this with the paper's equation. Uh, if we go through this, uh, uh, you, you're gonna see like this is like the notations that they used in the in the paper. But anyway, the the, the weight vector w is quantized using the quantizer, <coughs> and the and the resulting quantized vector q um, is gonna be stored within this q1. So this q1 I think is gonna keep track. Um, all of these because we're gonna go through these columns within the loop. Uh, I think that's what this does. Then we have this here. Uh, I think we're gonna compute the loss and update the variable that keep track of the loss and errors. That's what this does. I think it's gonna be weight. Yeah, it's gonna be weight. We're gonna subtract this and we're gonna square them gonna square the difference. I think we covered this also in the in the paper. Then uh, what's this? We have we have the error and squeeze one that multiply. So I think this uh, the remaining columns in the block are gonna be updated by subtracting the error uh, and uh, the corresponding rows in the hash matrix. So this is the same thing that we spoke we've been repeating in the papers that Essentially, we're going to calculate the loss, then we're going to update the remaining weights uh, based on the Hessian matrix, uh, the Hessian inverse matrix. So I think that's what is going to happen in that case. So, yeah, um, so I think that's that. So uh, the final thing that we do, it's not necessarily final because this is still in the, in the loop of the block. But what we do in this case is that we update the weight and the matrix. So in this case, we, the, the remaining column of the weight is updated by subtracting the, the quantization error. So, but uh, the, the, the main thing is that by, by the end of this full loop is that the, the, the self dot layer will be assigned to the quantized weights, as you can see here, and they're gonna take the, the self layer dot shape. That's what this will do. So, but but this is like the the, the, the main idea, the main core thing uh, behind this. Um, I hope I, I was at least able to give you like an idea of what's going on in this code. Um, what I'll do in the next video, I'll uh, create part two. So we're gonna try all means to quantize the Lama model. 
I think we have a, a, at least a, a better understanding of this, what's going on here. So if now we go through this and quantize it, we're going to actually solidify our understanding and we can actually uh, try to apply this technique to different models with different structures because we have a good understanding of this. But yeah, I think that's that, guys. I'm going to start, like I said, I'm going to push a lot of efficient deep learning videos. We're going to cover sparsity, GPT. A lot of videos are going to be coming. Uh, so this is going to be one of the priorities within this channel just to cover like all these efficient deep learning techniques. But uh, with that said, I just want to say thank you if we did watch our all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Bye.